you very much for so many people being here. It's absolutely great. And I especially love being back here. I enjoyed last year so much with all of you. It was fantastic. Now, last time I talked about something a little bit controversial in Korea, tattoos. This time, the subject seems to be not so controversial. Great art. I mean, who doesn't love great art? Right? But first I have to find out, what do you think art is? So, if I say the word art, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Just shout it out. First thing. Beauty. Okay. Beauty. Painting. Creativity. Okay. Yes. Painting is usually the thing that everybody goes, oh yes, okay, he's an artist, she's an artist, they must be painters, okay, they must be painters. But we have to define things a little bit more than that. So traditionally, we sort of look at painting, sculptures, music, and literature as being art. And of course, you know, people like Shakespeare, great art. Okay, Picasso, great art. ACDC, great art? Yes. Yeah, I think so. I absolutely think so, and I'll tell you later why I think so. Um, but, a little bit controversial. How about movies? Are movies art? <coughs> yes. yes, some movies are. Some movies aren't. Just as some paintings are art, great art, and some aren't. Okay, how about TV shows? <coughs> are they art? A little bit. <coughs> how about fashion? Okay, so in a way I want to start by saying to you that my personal definition of art ties in with what you were saying about beauty. If whatever is made by hands and imagination and creativity moves us, to say, oh wow, it's art. And that's one of the reasons why I am the owner of an Apple iPhone and not a Samsung because I feel that the iPhone is art, that the Samsung is just technology. You can argue with me about that one later. So, we've answered the question to a certain extent what is art, but now we have to answer what is great art? Great art. How do we know it? How do we judge it? What, what do we decide? How do we decide? Difficult. Okay, so let's look at an example. Would you say that is great art? No? Yes? Maybe? Okay. How about that? No. Comparing these two, we can definitely say that that is not great art. But in fact, both of these pictures hang on the walls of museums. So is being included in a museum the definition of great art? Well, one of them hangs in the Picasso Museum. It's Picasso from his blue period. One of them hangs in the Museum of Bad Art. 
which is in San Diego. And the Museum of Bad Art was started by somebody who walked past a rubbish dump and saw a painting and thought, that is such a bad painting, it's actually good. It mustn't end up on the rubbish dump. I'm going to rescue it. And so he started the Museum of Bad Art. And these days, you can actually go online, type in Museum of Bad Art, or M-O-B-A, and have a look at some of the pictures. I've got one more to show you. So I think one of the first things we learn from this is that sometimes we can judge by comparison, by comparing one thing to another. We can see that in this one, the lines of the figures convey an emotion. When we look at it, we feel the sadness of the mother and the child. Are they refugees? Are they just crying? Are they just in the middle of the night? We don't know, but it gives us an emotion. That one just makes us want to run away screaming, or at least it does me. I just want to run away screaming myself. Okay, so we look for obvious differences. Obvious differences. Art? Well, somebody created it, so there was creativity in it. Somebody sat down and picked up brushes and, and actually did that. And you can sort of see what it's supposed to be, can't you? What is it supposed to be? Some kind of sea battle? Yeah, there's, there's one ship on fire and the other ship firing cannons. Although, I must say, that ship looks more like a bucket than anything else, but I don't know who this guy is that's watching everything, you know, through his binoculars. But now let's look at someone who did know how to paint and knew how to paint sea battles. Turner, the Battle of Trafalgar. What do we see as differences? Well, first of all, look at the level of detail in this one. Incredible detail. Somebody was very patient in painting that. Turner took his time. He made sure that every brush stroke, everything that he put on the canvas, said what he wanted to say about this battle. But also, if you look at that picture, are the boats just sitting there in the water? I mean, in that one, the two things are just sitting there in the water. You have no idea of the water moving, of the ships moving, of the sky. But in this one, the sky is moving, the people are moving, the ships are moving. Look at how those two ships are crashing into each other. You can look at it for hours and hours and hours and still see new things every time you look. Okay, let's now look at the influence that culture has on whether we consider something great art or not. So when I was researching this, I looked at a lot of Korean painters, and I'm sure all of you are going to tell me who that is. Come on, Lara, Lara. Kim hong -do. Kim hong yes. <laughs> famous, I mean, famous, famous, famous artist. Now, when Western eyes first looks at a Kim hong picture, 
it looks a little bit naive to us. It looks a little bit, you know, perspective. Where is the perspective? Why is it looking as if the person is sitting here above everyone, looking down at them, instead of like the other paintings, looking at the people? But then when you look at it, when you spend time with it, you start seeing all the wonderful little things that he's got, all the people. Each person has a different expression. And you can see what they're thinking, and it's the village. And you realize that, yes, it had to be painted this way. And you realize it was genius. It is great art. Oh, sorry. That one, how does it look to your eyes, the second picture? Busy. What do you, f it's very busy. Very crowded. Do you like it? Do you like it? How many people like it? How many people don't like it? Ah, okay. This is a batik by one of the leading artists of Ghana. And she is famous all over the world. Kempe for her batiks. So she is considered a great artist, but it's a cultural thing. You are not used to this idea of so many colors and so many things all into the same space, and there's too much going on. It's overwhelming. And the figures all seem to be very stiff, almost like robots. So, culture, what our culture has taught us to appreciate is part of how we view great art. And now, sculptures are another part of the classic thing of art. So, you all know that one, yes? It's David, very, very famous sculpture. Anyone tell me who the sculptor is? Famous person. He was also a painter. Painted the Sistine oh, Chapel. Da Vinci? Michelangelo, yes. Okay, so Michelangelo's sculpture of David is famous also for the story behind it. It is said, and I don't know if this is true or not, that when he got the block of marble to do this sculpture, there was a crack in it. There was a flaw. And he had to adapt how he did the figure, which is why we've got the one arm seemingly holding nothing. It's actually holding his sling. But he had to adapt, and it wasn't really classical at the time. The classical statues were posed differently at the time he sculpted it. So a lot of people were unhappy with it at the time, but now, we consider it the best example of the sculptor's art. Along came this guy. Anyone know who this is? That is a sculpture. Just looks like a stone, but it's a sculpture. It's Henry Moore. In the 1950s and 60s, Henry Moore started making a name for himself, sculpting these abstract forms, circles, triangles, waves, things like that. And a lot of people started following him. And he started getting sculptures made out of ironwork and a lot of other things. 
And the best example of why none of you actually know about Henry Moore is this sculpture. That's a sculpture. Really, really, it's a sculpture. Now I have to tell you the story. It was mentioned that I once worked as a scientist. The place I worked for was called the Council for Mineral Technology. And they had very small premises at the University of the Witwatersrand. And so they got a new building, big, wonderful building, in another part of Johannesburg. And they decided that they needed an entrance. You know, here in Korea, all the universities have some kind of entrance. So they decided they need an entrance. Okay. So they decided they need a sculptor. Because sculptors make entrances, archways, things like that. Okay. Living in South Africa at that time was a disciple of Henry Wirth called Eduardo Villa. And Eduardo Villa had long flowing white hair and a thick Italian accent. And he came to the place and he walked around looking at everything that was there. And then he said, Oh, I do not need to sculpt anything for you. You have wonderful sculpture there already. It was the great concrete water tower. We paint it red to symbolize the flame leaping up into the sky. And so the water tower was painted red and is now known as an Eduardo Villa sculpture. Anyone think that that is great art? Not really. In fact, most of the people who drive past that every day don't know that it's a sculpture. They just know it as the red water tower. That's how they refer to it. Okay, so we've now seen a little bit of different forms of art. And I could keep you here, I think, until 12 o'clock tonight, giving you examples from music and giving you examples from fashion and giving you examples from movies of good art, bad art. But let's talk now about how are we going to decide that something is great art. Well, the first thing that we can perhaps look at is what do the art critics say about it? Now, I don't know here in Korea because I don't read Korean, and certainly the Korea Times and the Korea Herald have a page where they review movies but they don't have a critics page like the New York Times has. So are we going to look at what the critics say about something to decide whether it's great art or not? What do you think? Should we? Maybe. Maybe because they are just people like you and me. And the best known example of how critics can argue among themselves is the case of the big-eyed children. Uh, I think it was the late 60s, early 70s. Suddenly, everywhere you went, you saw pictures of a couple of children, maybe one child, maybe a child and an adult, small bodies, big heads, and huge, enormous eyes, looking at you, all sad. And it turns out that the person who painted them was actually a woman. 
but her husband took the credit for painting them. And her husband sold millions, millions of these pictures because everybody loved them. People just loved them. Which of course is the popular money and subject matter. So he made a lot of money out of those pictures. And a lot of the critics were going, oh, this is so different from anything we've seen before. This is innovative. This is wonderful. Today, nobody remembers his name. And nobody remembers those pictures. In fact, the Museum of Bad Art probably has one or two of them hanging on their walls. Okay? So, no. The critics got it wrong. There was one critic who did speak out against him at the time and said, oh, rubbish, terrible, 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 horrible. So maybe we should take a little bit of notice of the critics. Definitely not of money. How about subject matter? What do I mean by that? What do people choose to paint? What did Kim Hong Do paint? People, the daily life of Korea. And a lot of people would say, oh, come on, I'm not interested in seeing how the village live. You know, no. Diamond Mountains, much better for great art, yes? Okay, so subject matter? Not really. How about the style? The style in which it is painted. No, because sometimes people get used to a style. How about Picasso? What is Picasso famous for these days? Certainly not the painting I showed you, but the paintings of funny noses, funny eyes, weird faces. That's what he became famous for. That is what we know him for. So, these are my two criteria for how you can judge whether something really is great art or not. How long has it been around? Did it stand the test of time? So at one time, it was in fashion, then it was out of fashion, then it was in fashion again. But it stuck around. People kept it. They wanted to keep it. And mastery in execution. What do I mean by mastery in execution? What, what is a master? Okay, I'm going to illustrate this with some of my artwork. And please, I am not suggesting that I am in any way ready for inclusion in great art. But I want to show you how I have been struggling personally with watercolor painting. Because my uncle was an oil painter, when I painted, I used to do oil painting. Now, oil painting is lovely. Because if you make a mistake, you can just paint more things over the top of it. Or if it's a really bad mistake, you can scrape it all off and start over again. If you try that with watercolor, you end up with a mess. So if you pass that around to people. That was one of my first ones that I tried doing in watercolor. And you will see it's a mess. I did not understand what I was doing. I did not understand the medium. I did not understand what I was trying to achieve. But I kept trying, and my next one, you know, a couple of tries later, 
Looks a little bit better. Looks a little bit better. But it, it's still, uh, it's still an oil painting, really, not a watercolor painting. And so I kept trying, and each time I would get a little bit better because I kept practicing and better. And better. Until finally I achieved something that I consider my masterpiece. Because for the first time in the whole painting, everything worked the way I wanted it to work. The water looks the way I want it to look. The clouds look the way I wanted it to look. The hills, the foliage, everything in that picture looks the way I wanted it to work. So mastery in execution, that's one of the things we have to look for. And if you remember those first two paintings that I showed you, what was wrong with the second one, the two faces? What was wrong with them? It was badly executed. The lines, the way in which those faces looked, they were just bad. You can pass them off to the others at the back there as well. So, mastery in execution and the test of time, the test of God. Now, in 100 years, will one of those paintings perhaps be up on someone's wall? And someone says, oh, you know, that was a bit, she could really paint. That would be great. But that's the other thing. The true painter, the true sculptor, the true artist is not doing it because they're going to make money or achieve fame or have any kind of reward beyond the one that I have with that final painting of saying, I did that well. I did that well. Now, of course, we have to think about why. Why does it matter whether we know that it's great art or not? We've been talking all this time just about art. And the subject is, why does it matter? Great art. One a day keeps the doctor away. Well, research has been showing it. Great art makes you smarter. Spending time with great art makes you smarter. And a study was done where a group of students, a group of schools actually, not just students, a whole group of schools, were involved in what was almost a lottery. A new museum was opened up, the Crystal Bridges Museum, and not all the schools could be accommodated for school visits. And so those two researchers, Kisida and Green, thought this is a wonderful opportunity to see what effect a museum visit really has on the students. Is it worth it? Because you know, really, if we're teachers and we take a group of students to the museum, you've got this. Essay on any subject they like. And then 
after the museum visit, they were asked to write four paragraphs about their museum visit. And then a month later, they were asked to write five paragraphs on their museum visit. And the schools who didn't go were given similar tasks. Obviously, they couldn't write about their museum visit, but they were also asked to write a four-paragraph essay and a five-paragraph essay. And they were given standardized language tests. Guess what? The museum visitors did better. They did better on those tests. It made them think. It brought things out in them. Um, MRI studies show that when we look at a beautiful painting, all of the brain's pleasure centers centers, the things that make us smile, the things that make us happy, light up. And we go, ooh. So, beautiful paintings, very important. Surround yourself with beautiful paintings. And not what I think is beautiful, or what the critics think is beautiful, or what anybody else thinks is beautiful. It is the painting that stops you and makes you stand there and look and go, wow, that's beautiful. Okay. Then, besides these sort of psychological effects, there's actual physical effects. If you attend a cultural event, your blood pressure actually goes lower. Very important, isn't it? Stress, elevates your blood pressure, high blood pressure, heart attacks, brain strokes, bad for your health. So, low blood pressure, attain cultural events. And lowers your stress hormones. So it has an actual physical effect on your body. Spending time with great art. Music reduces anxiety. Even ACDC. It does. It doesn't sound like it does, but yes, it reduces anxiety. And this is the really nice thing. People who have arthritis, they often have a lot of pain. Well, guess what? Listening to music helps them to not feel the pain without medication. And we all know a lot of pain medication is not a good thing for you. So listen to some music. And here is why you should be an artist. Not just look at great art, but be an artist. Singing improves the quality of life in people who have Alzheimer's or other mental diseases. If they sing, they are able to concentrate better, they are able to remember better, they start being able to take care of themselves. So sing, and I don't care if you sound terrible, don't mind if anybody else says to you, stop singing. No, I'm singing for myself. Like the carpenters said, sing, sing a song. Make it simple to last your whole life long. You know? Sing for yourself because it will benefit you. And if you read great literature, it develops an important part of society, empathy. You are able to feel what others feel. And so, great art is important for those reasons. And that is why, when people tell you that the focus here in universities should be on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, as a scientist, I want to tell you no. No. Some people are engineers and they should study engineering 
and they should not be stopped from studying engineering. If you, as a girl, want to study engineering, nobody should say to you, no, 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 engineering is only for boys. And if you, as a boy, want to study sewing and fashion design, nobody should tell you, no, 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 that's only for girls. That should stop. People should study what they really are passionate about. Because that's what we need. We need passionate people doing the thing that they love to do. So when we place a monetary value, whether we place it on art or on engineering or on music or on fashion, we actually demean it. That's why we could say some movies are not art. Why? They were made for money. They have no heart. They have no soul. They do not touch us. They do not make us feel better. Some music doesn't make us feel better, doesn't make us uplifted, doesn't make us feel and that is the role of art. It is that moment, the <sighs> moment. You want to look up the references? There they are. And thank you very much for paying attention tonight. <laughs>